Morning came on February 2nd, 2012, and for the first time in 15 years, transit workers had decided to strike. Until a rostering conflict was resolved, 55,000 Haligonians would have to find a new way to move. I personally had to walk 10 kilometers this morning. That's a pain in the ass. The strike dragged on for 41 days. Regular transit user or not, pretty much everyone was worse off without it. But still, it wasn't clear who exactly transit was for. Was transit just a service for those that don't drive, or was it more than that? Now in 2022, Halifax Transit is in the midst of some major changes, but are we any closer to understanding why we have public transit? Nowadays, we think of transit as a public service, but it wasn't always this way. North America's longest running saltwater ferry was privately operated when it began in 1752. Private still in 1816, when it was literally powered by nine onboard horses. Still private in 1836, with the introduction of the first steamship ferry, which meant those horses were out of a job, but magically, there was much more horsepower. By 1890, the high cost of ferry operation had led to poor service and high fares. Fed up with the private operators, the ratepayers of Dartmouth demanded a public ferry. This led to the first version of truly public transit in the region. On land, 1896 saw the first electric tram on the Halifax Peninsula. Ownership of the trams changed hands many times, but was always privately owned and operated by the reigning electricity company. By the late 40s, the tram system had deteriorated beyond repair. So, the Nova Scotia Light and Power Company made the switch to the newest and sexiest technology of the time, trolley buses. Soon later, the opening of the McDonald Bridge in 1955 fundamentally changed transit in Halifax. With more cars on the road, and what used to be the sky, ridership on the trolley buses and the ferry plummeted. By the 60s, buses were no longer a viable business though people still expected the service. So, in 1969, the city of Halifax took over the bus system. Transit was now public. Public transit is really important. It allows people who don't drive to fully participate in the city at an affordable cost. But it does way more than just that. Public transit is also more sustainable and significantly more space efficient than cars. But here's the Cracker Jack. Early transit advancements like trams and steamships provided a measurable upgrade to what they replaced. When cars became commonplace in the 40s, the upgrade was in cars, not transit. There's an undeniable appeal to cars. They take you where you want, when you want. You may have to wait in traffic, but there's no waiting in the rain at a car stop. The car's promise of ultimate mobility freedom has literally changed the way we build cities, which in turn fundamentally shape transit. To compete, transit must offer a similar level of spontaneity that cars have. On top of spontaneity, cars also provide a level of comfort that public transit usually doesn't match. Our ferries do a great job at comfort. They're on time, they're spacious, they have nice terminals, and you get a great view. Okay, most of the time. Our buses lag behind in the comfort department. They can definitely be pleasant, but at peak times, they can be loud, late, cramped, they can jostle, and because they jostle, we don't allow food or drink. And to catch a bus, riders typically have to wait in the elements, which for some, simply isn't feasible because of accessibility issues. To boost ridership, transit needs to compete with comfort, but also frequency and reliability. At least on paper, Halifax Transit seems like they're committed to doing that. One of their strategic initiatives is to promote transit as a competitor to the single occupant vehicle. Some recent developments have been the procurement of 60 electric buses, the Woodside Ferry Terminal renovation, and the Bayers Road Q-Jump. Turns out Halifax Transit already has a plan aimed at improving the system. It's called the Rapid Transit Strategy, and it includes two types of transit an expanded ferry service and bus rapid transit, also known as BRT, not to be confused with BLT. BRT would bring rapid transit every 10 minutes 
all day, every day, within walking distance of 120,000 people, it's expected to have tens of thousands of daily boardings. In comparison, the Bedford Ferry is only expected to have around 2,000 daily boardings and comes with higher per user operating and capital costs. Implementation of the strategy is reliant on funding from all three levels of government. On the ferry front, there's good news. The Bedford Ferry has been endorsed by the province and research for an electric ferry is underway. But since HRM Council adopted the strategy, three different provincial premiers have snubbed BRT. The ferry is an important project in its own right, just not comparatively. So why was it prioritized? Well, it's hard to say. It has been talked about for decades, so there is a legacy aspect there. But maybe we just view ferries as an upgrade to driving, while buses are viewed as a downgrade. And with the way we've historically funded buses, that might be true. So, why do we have public transit? It doesn't feel fair to say that it's just a service for those that don't drive, but it still feels more like a side salad than an entree in the mobility meal. New ferries are necessary if transit's to ever become the entree. But we can't disregard projects like BRT, which have a greater impact on day-to-day -day movement. But either way, here at Plan FX, we see public transit as an essential service that improves lives and is more sustainable than other options. And the great thing about it is, the more it improves, the more everyone benefits. Cracker Jack? Yeah.